Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Our sermon text for our meditation this morning is our gospel lesson recorded for us in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 13th chapter, read it in verses 24 through 30, and then 36 through 43. I invite you to please rise for the life of our Lord. He, that is Jesus, presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed wheats among the wheat and went away. When the plants sprouted and produced heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? He said to them, An enemy did this. The servants asked him, Did you want us to go and gather up the weeds? No, he answered, because when you gather up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with them. But let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first gather up the weeds, bind them in bundles and burn them. Then gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus sent the people away and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered them, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will pull out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and those who continue to break the law. The angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Lord, these are Your words, and therefore they are Your truth. We ask that You'd increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. Dear fellow redeemed, over these last few weeks we've been considering this theme, Define Christian. And last week, Pastor Weekman shared with us this illustration from Scripture that describes a Christian as one who is planted by the Word. We are described as, as plants who are, are ultimately produced and watered and nourished by the Word of God. This morning, Jesus continues that imagery of Christians as plants. Specifically, he pictures us as wheat. But his illustration is different today. He describes us Christians as living as wheat among weeds. And so this morning, we focus that On that is our theme, that Christians live as wheat among weeds. We see that it's not our job to rid the world of weeds. We see that God wants us to live as wheat among the weeds, mindful of the eternal harvest. In Jesus' parable, the workers notice something soon after the farmer has planted his field. They notice weeds. And it must not be simply ordinary weeds that pop up, but there is so many of them that they figure, well, someone must have done something here. Who's to blame? Where do they point their finger? Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? It seemed like they blamed the master, right? He must be the one. It must be his fault. Mistakenly, he must have picked up the wrong sack or one mixed with some weed seed in it and sown his field with the seed of of weeds. Maybe it reminds us of many in our world today. When they consider the problem of evil, they can point the finger at God. It's his fault. What does the master say? An enemy did this. God is not the one to blame for evil. God designed this world to be perfect and good in every way. But, the critics say, didn't God make evil an option at least? Yes, it is true that God did give free will to both human beings and to angels. That was part of his creation. 
Would perhaps we rather God have created us like robots, only able to do exactly what he programmed us to do? But God gave mankind and the angels free will as an opportunity for them not to sin. That wasn't his desire at all. He didn't want them to do evil. He didn't want them to sin, but as a way for them to show their love and appreciation for their creator, God. So ultimately, who is to blame? Well, it is the devil, isn't it? You think of the devil who used his free will to turn against God, to disobey him, and as a result was cast out of heaven. And so as he came down to earth, he sought to tempt mankind as well, to lead them astray, to turn them away from God. It's the devil then who sows the world with bad seed, with these weeds who threaten the wheat. He is the one who desires to destroy God's good crop and bring as many as he can to the eternal fires of hell. Note the immediate response of the servants. Do you want us to go and gather up the weeds? They're kind of like the teacher's pet who comes running up at recess. Teacher, teacher, Billy cheated at kickball. Do you want me to kick him out of the game? But what does the master say? No. You maybe imagine the puzzlement of the servants. What? Why wouldn't you want us to get rid of the weeds? Aren't you worried that the weeds are going to take up the nourishment from the soil and the moisture, that maybe they're going to block out the sun from from getting at the wheat? Aren't they going to inhibit their growth? Aren't you concerned at all about your crop? We think about a, a gardener. Wouldn't any good gardener want weeds to be taken out of his plot. But note what he says. He explains himself. Because when you gather up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with them. You see, the gardener is thinking about the well-being of the wheat. He is concerned with them, and that's precisely why he doesn't want the weeds pulled up. He's afraid that as the weeds are being pulled up, the wheat might be taken with them. It's important for us to note that the weed mentioned in our text for today is something called a darnel. It's something that looks very similar to a stalk of wheat when it's in its early stages of growth, hardly distinguishable between the two. And yet when the darnel grows and finally produces its fruit, it is poisonous, and it's easy to tell the difference at that point. And so Jesus is especially pointing out this fact that it's hard to tell the difference at times between what is wheat and what is weed in this world. In our zealousness to try to rid the world of all unbelievers, all the weeds, we might very well pull up the wheat, not being able to tell the difference between the two. And why is that? We know that believers are only those that believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior from sin. They are the wheat, right? However, faith is something that isn't visible to the human eye. We cannot see into the heart of another human being to see if they are truly a believer in Christ. Only God can see that. So we easily could make a mistake. There was an administrator at a Michigan community college some years ago who had served in that college for 11 years, and he had done an excellent job. In fact, he had done such an excellent job that he was hand-selected by the Board of Regents to be among the finalists to serve as the new president for that institution. Well, over the course of the routine process, as they did a background check, they discovered they, they actually didn't have any documentation of his master's and doctoral degrees. And so as they were interviewing him, they sat him down and, and made him aware of, of the issue, kind of a formality. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. I'll make sure to go and, and get my credentials and bring them to you. He never returned to the meeting. He never returned to the college. It was clear that he wasn't who he said he was. But what made so many confused is that he had done such a good job as an administrator for so long at that institution. 
Could it be that, that we, maybe as we view those in this world, might confuse weeds for wheat? As we think of individuals in our own community that maybe seem so kind and so morally upright, individuals that maybe give so much of their time to volunteer to help those in need, people that donate so much to charity, we maybe say to ourselves, certainly these are among the weeds, certainly they are Christians, and if not, won't God recognize their good works on the final day? Well, the Scriptures say no. The Scriptures say only those that are wheat are those that believe in Jesus as their Savior. In fact, the Scripture also says in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. God views none of those things as good works in His sight without faith. And as Jesus says in John 3, the one who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Not only can we maybe confuse a weed for wheat, but we could also confuse wheat for a weed. We think of other individuals that maybe don't look the way that we think that a Christian should look or act the way we think that a Christian should act. Maybe someone at times who is filled with anger. Maybe someone at times who falls into sin again and again. Maybe say, certainly that person can't possibly be a Christian. But could it be that maybe they are? Maybe God has brought them to the knowledge of the truth, knowing their Savior Jesus Christ. Maybe it is that they, as all Christians, are struggling against their own sinful flesh. And as we, too, they often lose the battle. Or could it be that there are others who are unbelievers at the present time, and yet God has chosen them for eternal salvation, and God has a plan to bring to them the knowledge of the truth through His Word. We think about the Apostle Paul, who in his early years, he was totally opposed to the message of the gospel, totally opposed to Christ, trying to do anything he could to tear down the church. And yet God had a plan, didn't he? A plan to bring him to faith, to bring him eternal salvation, showing him his Savior, Jesus Christ, making a wheat out of a weed. And so Jesus tells us, the weeding will wait to the harvest. Don't worry yourselves with weeding out unbelievers now. That's not your job. And that's important for us to recognize, right? God doesn't want us to do physical harm to unbelievers in this world. That's not our job. Yes, if there is earthly justice that needs to be carried out, it's to be carried out by the ones that God has called to that work. We think about earthly government, that he has given them the role and responsibility to carry out justice if earthly justice is needed. And if eternal justice is needed, that is ultimately the work of God that he'll carry out on the final day. And so what does he ultimately desire us to do? Well, he wants us to live as wheat, mindful of that eternal harvest. Now, part of us might be comforted in knowing that God is going to bring all evil to justice on the final day. All evildoers are going to be brought to justice in the judgment. But it's also a terrifying thought, isn't it? Especially as we consider what Jesus describes in the parable as he says what's going to happen. He's going to send out reapers, the angels. And the angels are going to separate the weeds from the wheat. And note how Jesus talks about their work. They will pull out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and those who continue to break the law. That's terrifying, isn't it? Do we ever cause others to sin? Do we ever tempt others or lead others astray into sin? Maybe saying that it's not that big of a deal, don't worry about it. Do we ourselves break the law? Maybe we've repented of that sin, but do we continue to go back again and, and break the law? It's terrifying to think, is God going to see us as wheat or weeds in the final judgment? Especially when we think about our own record of wrongs. You know what he also describes? He describes the wheat 
as righteous. The righteous who will shine like the sun in the sky on the last day. You know, that term righteous is used time and time again in Scripture to describe believers. And not because they're so good and upright all the time in the things that they do on their own, but they are righteous through faith in Christ. You think about what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. God tells us plainly there what He has done. He has taken our sin, all of those sins where we have led others astray, all of those sins where we have broken His law, and He has laid them all on Christ. He has made Him to be sin for us. You see, Christ has suffered the fires of your hell. He has suffered the weeping and gnashing of teeth that you deserve at the judgment. And what has He given you in exchange? He has given you something that you don't deserve. He has given you His righteousness, His holiness, that is yours only through faith in Him. Through trusting that He is the one that has paid the price for your sin. Through trusting that He is the one that has perfectly obeyed the law in your place. His righteousness becomes yours by faith. So that God does not see you as a weed, but as wheat, holy and perfect in His sight, blameless in every way. And that is how He would have you live even now. A few decades ago when I was in the service, I was um, supposed to move duty stations from California to Georgia, and I was going to have to make a 40-hour car ride with all my earthly possessions uh, of cross-country. A friend of mine decided to go with me. Well, along that journey, just so by chance, it happened that we were going through the state of Louisiana during the month of February. And we decided to take a detour along our trip and to go to New Orleans because we were passing through during the celebration of Mardi Gras. And we had heard so much about this uh, famous celebration that the town has every year, and we were curious to see what it was all about. We were quite shocked as we went through the small towns on the way into New Orleans to see all the parades and to note how family-oriented it all seemed because that wasn't the depiction that we had seen on TV that is, until we hit Bourbon Street in New Orleans. And when we hit Bourbon Street in New Orleans in mid-afternoon, it is, was quite a decadent place and, and disturbing. Even though there weren't many people there, those that were there, among them we saw a number of middle-aged men with their video cameras out waiting to get a peep show to record it. We didn't spend much time there and eventually went on to a famous coffee shop in town and had dinner there. Later on that night, though, we decided to head back to our car, crossing again through Bourbon Street. But now it was very different. The partiers had filled that entire street, and there were uh, people that were drinking to excess all over the place, uh, people with little clothing on. As we were moving through the streets, though, what was especially shocking to us is what we saw at every intersection along Bourbon Street. Christians locked arm in arm at the intersections with big signs, repent, the end is near, hell is real. As they had megaphones shouting at the crowd and the drunks were antagonizing them, I told my buddy, we got to get out of here. This is like apocalyptic, this is like the end of the world, and I felt like we were on the wrong side of things. You know, even though I, I didn't necessarily 100% agree with the approach of the Christians that we saw on Bourbon Street that night, it made me think, had my buddy and I uh, foolishly thought that we could blend in among the crowd as wheat among weeds, thinking that it wasn't that big of a deal, we're just there to observe after all. But what does Jesus tell us? What does God say in His Word in Ephesians 5? Do not participate in fruitless deeds of darkness. Instead, expose them. And God reminds us in Revelation chapter 2, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
No, God doesn't desire us to try to blend in among the weeds of this world. To say that it's no big deal to be caught up with the things that the, the weeds are, are doing. But instead, he desires us to shine like the sun. We think about that picture in our lesson for today, that the righteous will shine like the sun on the final day. We think of the sun in the sky and all of its glory and brightness. It's so bright you can hardly look at it without going blind. It reminds us of the way that Jesus shone forth on the Mount of Transfiguration with the glory of God. We're going to shine like that on the final day. God wants us to shine even now. And even though we can't shine like the glory of the sun in the sky now, we can shine with the glory of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Knowing Him as our Savior for, from sin. Shining. Shining forth with love and, and good deeds, acts of service toward our fellow man in obedience to God's commands, even now showing our thankfulness, showing the love of Christ that we have. And also, desiring to reach the weeds, to share with them the reality the judgment is coming, to warn them, repent, and to know their Savior, Jesus Christ, the only one, for even those that appear very moral and upright, that God is going to come to judge all sin and all sinners will be condemned. And the only way of salvation is through Christ. Yes, it is true. Christians live as wheat among weeds in this world. God doesn't desire us to start taking the weeds out of this world by tearing them up and causing them physical harm. Instead, he desires us to live as wheat among the weeds, to shine forth with the righteousness of Christ, to live for him, knowing what he has done for us, and, and living our lives in appreciation for what he has done, but also sharing with others the only way of salvation that's found in Christ, that they too can be spared the judgment in him. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen.